in back Uptown Social. We're gonna be talking to Kara Graves. So Kara was called out by Keith Benjamin, and Kara is a specialist, a marketing specialist, director of marketing, and she's a partner in the business. And I think that this is the way the industry is going. These these key roles uh, that you need to be successful today, like marketing you need to have these players on your team to take it to that next level uh you can't do it alone anymore so uh, i'm sure in today's conversation we're going to be talking about their business model a little bit further keith kind of expounded on that but i want to get kara's or sorry kara's perspective and we're also going to dive deep into the world of marketing how kara has uh evolved as a marketer and where Uptown Social and the greater uh, Uptown Hospitality Group is with their marketing uh, and the, the, the marketing landscape in general, where they're headed, the, the future of marketing in the restaurant industry, the future of social media. Uh, and hopefully at some point today, we'll just be able to walk around and talk about the uh, intentionality of the space. There's little things all over the place, branding everywhere. So no matter where you are in this restaurant, People know where you are, which is super valuable. So I'm in for a treat. I know I am. I cannot wait to get after this. Stick around. This episode is brought to you by Restaurant Systems Pro. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, senior partner and director of marketing at Uptown Hospitality Group, Kara Graves. Kara, are you feeling unstoppable today? I sure am. Yes, I cannot wait to dive into your area of expertise marketing and to share your story and to share what Uptown Social is all about in the greater Uptown uh, Restaurant Group, uh, but uh, sorry, Uptown Hospitality Group. But let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling with a successful quote or mantra what do you got for us so my success quote is actually fairly new um there's a podcaster um kind of an inspiration to me her name is mel robbins and um her quote that i absolutely love is the time is now don't hit snooze on your life the time is now don't hit snooze on your life is there more to that quote or were you just about to reflect on it? Well, I just I just love that. Like when you, when you hit snooze in the morning, you think about the fact that like, okay, I'm just going to snooze for a couple more minutes, get a little bit more sleep. But you really are postponing your day. You're postponing your life. It's the one thing that you can't get back is time. Yeah. And I just, I just, I just love it. Why and do you think people hit snooze? Because they don't want to get out of bed. They yeah. don't want to start their day. They're yeah. warm. They're cozy. They're comfy. Take that analogy and put it to the to life now in business. Why don't? You, why do you think people put things off? Um, I think that they're scared. I think they're intimidated. Um, maybe sometimes, yeah, they yeah. don't know where to start. They don't know what to do. They feel overwhelmed. Um, yeah, that's in any job, any industry. Um, and if you're not you're not excited, you're not passionate about what you're doing. I think it's really really hard to kind of get yourself yeah. there. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm guilty of this. I think a, I think most people are. I as somebody, you know, like I, I identify as somebody who's not great with attention to detail. Uh, I've always, you know, was in that special class for learning disabilities, like a slow learner. And I always uh, there's this narrative like I'm gonna screw it up, I'm gonna fuck it up. Like if I do, if like I'm not the person to do this, and because of that, nothing gets done sometimes. Uh, and I just finished reading the book, um, The Practicing Mind. From Tom Walter, or sorry, I always say Tom Walter because he's a past guest on the show. Tom Sterner, uh, also the author of uh, "It's Just a Thought," and he, he wrote another book called "Fully Engaged," which I did not get to read. But it's about this. It's like you are exactly where you're supposed to be in your life. Don't stress. Don't worry. Just start. Just do the work. And if you choose to av- ignore the thoughts, the fear, the anxiety, and you just focus on doing the thing, that there's there's almost uh what's the word there's like that in itself is meditative doing the work doing the practices being in the thing is meditative and the the thoughts will go away what what are you thinking of as i'm saying this well so i know that we are going to brush upon this far more but specifically in a marketing sense i think that's the number one thing is that you can sit down and you can think about all of these ideas but if you don't actually put the pen to paper and you don't actually do the work what are you doing, yeah. right? What are your activations? What is your marketing strategy? What What is it? Because there are a lot of creative people out there, but I think the difference is the people that actually do it versus the people that just think about it. Yeah, and that's why I'm here with these cameras 
by myself with no videographer this stuff scares the shit out of me i'm not gonna lie it's but scary like, it's but intimidating like, you know what else scared the shit out of me once this and this and now i don't even think about it yeah so it, where you are right now is where you is exactly where you're supposed to be he, he uses this beautiful analogy with like a seed and a plant a seed isn't a plant but the seed's not worried about becoming a plant the seed is just a seed in that moment and like you will become what you envision Right. As long as you keep showing up. Every right. Day. Right. Yeah. I totally, totally agree. So I'm glad that you can yeah. relate to that. Yeah. yeah. So where, tell me, where does it make sense to start sharing your story? Um, hmm, I, I guess kind of from the beginning, just, just my hospitality background and then kind of into how I got here. But you didn't know when you were working in restaurants early in your career, you didn't know that this was exactly what you wanted. No, I did not even know if I was going to make this a career or not. So when did you know that this is like, I, I want to buy into this. I, this might be my path, the hospitality industry. When did that happen? Like, take us to that point, the beginning. Um, okay. Well, or if I there's feel more like beyond that, feel free. I, I feel like, especially as a young woman, you are constantly told to do something else. And I've worked in hospitality. I'm not even kidding. Since I was a little kid, I grew up on a vegetable farm. I worked in my, my uncle's vegetable stand during the summer. My, I'm telling you, I was like, like child labor, like 10 <laughs> years old. Um, and I was also a competitive gymnast and I taught birthday parties when I was like 14, 15 wow. and I was serving cake and chips and sandwiches and teaching little kids how to jump on the trampoline. And <laughs> so like when I tell you, I have been doing it my entire life. My, my mom, my dad, they met in a pizzeria and a bar, my mom and my stepdad, they met working in a nice. restaurant. Um, it's really been in my blood, in my yeah. bones. Um, I believe it. Forever. Like, from the moment I met you, you're clearly socially and emotionally intelligent. Like That's all from hospitality. Yeah. I kid you not. And that, I do believe that is, you know, genetic. You know, I think that it's it's a, like just like in any type of intelligence is genetic. Social and emotional intelligence is something. If your parents are, you know, social people, it usually trickles down for sure. Yeah. 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 So, I would say. So did you want to, to take a, a you know, a path into hospitality. At a so, I always, so I always okay. did it. Well, it was, it was two things. A, I felt like it was a skill that was going to be useful no matter where I was in life. So right. True. You could, you could get a job anywhere. Yeah. Um, and it was also a great way to make money and yeah. a great way to make meet people. Um, so I, I, I always wanted to do that as a part-time gig, no matter what I did it all throughout college. I did it in my early twenties, um, and had second, third jobs as well. And, for a long time, I fought it, right? I went to a four-year school. I went to um, a college in upstate New York. Um, actually did gymnastics there, which is why I went. Nice. And um, once I graduated, I had actually started as a studio art major. So I always kind of had that creative um, side of my brain, which I always loved. That was always my passion, doing something creative. Um, but I always... What is studio art versus other art? I'm curious. Maybe studio art is like just like a generalized art major so, so like drawing the, painting art history like sculptures a swath of all the arts to understand exactly and you would just take different classes in that under that umbrella got it um and then i was like i i love this but it's a little non-conventional so i switched to a pr and marketing major which i was like you know what this will be far more useful so you love the art but you didn't see it being practical correct got it um and I knew I always wanted to go to New York City and I like truly based my life off of Sex and the City. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to be Carrie Bradshaw. I can't write to save my <laughs> life. So I will draw or paint or market or work in PR, work in fashion, something. So I, I feel like I might be missing an element of the story because you said that you always wanted to do hospitality, but you were told not to. Well, I loved that as a part-time gig and as a fallback plan but that was not my goal my goal was to work in new york city Why? for some sorry i don't know for like a fashion house or Got it. do something that was maybe a little bit more at the time well respected um because that was my biggest pitfall with hospitality is i felt like you're drawn to it but this isn't a real but job. this isn't a real job that's yeah. right. Isn't that the overarching theme always? At yeah. least 10, 15 years ago, it's like 
Especially, when are you, yeah. you going to get a real, real job? I mean, I could totally relate to that. Growing up, my parents owned a restaurant, and I remember being like, when I have a restaurant, they're like, no, 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 no. We work so hard, so you don't have to. Right, right. Right. Uh, so, I mean, but I think that I do get it, though, at the same time, because for the longest time, it was really difficult to make it, especially if you didn't own the business, yep. right? If you're a general manager or whatever, you could be working 80 hours a week. You're not yep. going to be making a lot of money to support your family. Like, I get it. And I yep. think that the industry is guilty of this. Um, maybe we'll shelf the, the, that for later, but hopefully with the podcast and other resources, we change that. And we, let I the, already think it really yeah. has, I think with podcasting, I think, um, truly with social media, with the internet, I think it's changed the game. I think that people now realize that this can be a serious career and it's not just, being on your feet and working late hours and long yeah. or late nights, long hours. Um, we were unreasonable. A quick buck. We were unreasonable. And I kind of push back sometimes at Will Gardera's book, Unreasonable Hospitality, because I get that it's good to kind of go beyond the guest ex- expectation. But to be unreasonable, I think, kind of hurts the industry, you know, because you in said what way? In the way that um, we have a fiscal responsibility. And not every restaurant has the financial resources that a Union Square hospitality restaurant does in the middle of New York City where your target market is the most wealthy people. And you can charge ridiculous prices. You know, and when we all try to deliver that level of hospitality, they have somebody on staff whose job it is to write thank you letters, to figure out what gifts to buy somebody. Yeah, that's next you know level. I mean? That's exactly. yeah, that's something that's so they, unique. You can afford to be unreasonable. Right. And when other people try to match that level of unreasonableness, like what ends up happening is the guest expectation becomes unreasonable because that becomes standard. Like right. getting a free meal if you don't like it. You know what I'm saying? Like yes, and at the same time, like when the consumer figures out that they can get a free meal, they're going to abuse it. Of course. You know, so like it's human nature. So like when a guest gets a meal and you're only making 5% profit on that meal, the guest expects that to be standard. Right. So what's happening is we're not spending, we're not charging what our worth because we're trying to be unreasonably generous. Yep. So it's in our DNA to over deliver yep. naturally. Yep. You know, and I think that it paints us into a corner and like we can be generous, we can be warm, but we're going to charge for it, <laughs> you know, so we're going to get that 10 plus percent, 15 percent, even 20 percent and not feel guilty. Right. So anyway, that's what I meant by it. No, 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 no. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, yeah. So anyway, I digress. Back to your story. <laughs> um, so you decided to go into uh, to marketing, HR, not HR, PR, you said. Yes, I was a PR and marketing major. Um, I still took art classes and almost immediately out of college, I got two separate internships in fashion PR in New York City unpaid internships again this is 15 years ago like I didn't even get a lunch stipend I was commuting on the subway I was taking I was walking down my block (laughs) taking a bus I was in the Bronx on City Island um, living at my dad and my stepmoms for the summer right out of college and I was taking the bus to the Pelham Bay Park on the 6th train taking that all the way to 125th street, then getting on the four, the five, then going across to, I mean, wow. I was commuting anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours a day back and forth. But this is a great skill to have in the hospitality industry. I mean, most of the best restaurants know that they need a publicist or a marketer on staff or outsource, right? I don't even think that our group, any of us knew that, that this was what was going to be needed Um, because really when I started with our group, it was back in 2012. I was in my early 20s. um, I got hired to bartend. I was a daytime bartender, Monday, Tuesday day. That was the only way I could get my foot in the door. Um, I know Keith brushed upon my story a little bit with my dad being his regular and me. I I had worked. um, uh, I was working a guerrilla marketing or a guerrilla advertising job, excuse me, Um, but I was in sales and I was cold calling for, I don't know, Eight hours a day. So, where, like, what was the what, what industry were you in when you before coming to the restaurant industry? Um, so I was in PR as an intern oh. in fashion, okay, and then fashion, right. once I, I decided I honestly like love fashion, not the industry for me. Yeah, the people was the number one thing, which I think is another reason why were they unreasonable? They were <laughs> unreasonable. They really were, and yeah. it was almost like. 
like a sorority or, or a fraternity. I think that they were hazed so badly when they were at, at entry level that they just like, it was just constant negativity and, and abuse. And I think another reason why I decided that ugh, the hospitality industry was the industry for me was the people. Yeah. I love restaurant people. So how long were you working in fashion and marketing before making the switch? Back About on? two years. Okay. Two so years. I was in PR um, and then I worked in textiles for a little bit and then, um, I moved into a marketing or an advertising sales job and I did that, I don't know, for maybe eight or nine months. All in the two years? All in those two years, what yeah. What the biggest lessons you learned about PR that stick with you to this day? I... that f Truly, that fashion PR is far di different than restaurant PR. Um, and I don't know if I even really understood what marketing and PR was until I started working for this group. Even though I had worked in, in the industry, I was more in a sales role. And as an intern, you don't really do all that much in the actual PR world. You're doing a lot of grunt work. Um, so I didn't really take that as much of a learning opportunity as much as it was kind of a foot in the door. Yeah. Um, and then when I was working in, in sales, I just, I just realized how absolutely difficult it was to push and promote something that you didn't believe in. Yes. Yes. That's, that was my biggest takeaway. And you're, oh my gosh, like that, I think when you believe in something, it doesn't become selling. No. It becomes persuading to make somebody's life better. Like, I listen, love that. I figured this out. I want you to figure it out too. And when you believe in it your whole body believes in it. Your body language believes in it. I think your heart believes in it. And then you start radiating. Like, I don't know if you believe in this shit, but like, there's a lot of evidence coming out that we all have like things that we've always known that everyone's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But now science is proving that, that there's nerves in your heart and that we send out. You like, feel waves. it, right? Yeah, you and, feel it. And other people feel when you feel it. So it's so powerful. And it, it, and it, but continue that train of thought. Well, again, going back to hospitality, I think that it, that was such a, a, pain point for me because I loved the restaurant business so much but every fiber of my being was telling me to do it and my brain and my surroundings were telling me don't do it like do not do this industry you have your four-year degree go get a job doing something else use your degree I didn't realize at the time that I was going to be able to use my marketing and my PR background for my current role, right? Yeah. Like you, you don't think that far ahead, especially again, going back 15 years ago when I was in college, like I didn't, you didn't realize that there were those kind of opportunities within the bar restaurant right. hospitality business. So you come into the hospitality industry, you have this background in PR and marketing and guerrilla marketing. I'm, I was kind of curious about ad, how guerrilla marketing translates to ads because I feel like when I think of guerrilla marketing, I'm thinking about like kissing babies, handing out flyers, talking to everybody in your yep, community. Yep. How does that translate to guerrilla marketing ads though? So what this company did specifically is actually would sell a guerrilla marketing idea or an activation to a company for far cheaper than your traditional advertising, like call it digital so or put online. A together to you and exactly. Sell you the strategy. Yeah. Yeah. And or okay. like um, an example would be like a, a rain stencil, which I think is a really cool idea, but they would have this, um, this bond that you would put on the sidewalk that would only appear once it rains. So you would do like maybe a logo or a message of some oh. sort. So you're actually selling that. And then our team would go out, you're we selling, would put selling. it. Yeah. Yeah. You're selling, selling. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Cool. So maybe that will manifest later in the conversation. So you get back, you get onto, and I always forget the mother company because there's Uptown uh, Hospitality Group. That's, which is yes, Charleston. that's Charleston. Yes. But your, your New York mama and dada, whatever you guys refer to them as, the, the, the grown up company, the, the originator. Yeah, that's Eat, Drink, and Be Merry, um, be formerly married. known as NYC Best Bars Got for it. people that have been in New York for 30 years. Got it. So you're hired on with this group, very well known established group in New York City. Yes. Um, you have this background. Yes, that I don't even know if anybody knew. I was I was curious. Like, did you want to end up doing marketing, or were you just like, I'm? Just no, do this was bartending. just a bartending job. Okay, That's so, it. So take me to that. Like, what was your goal then? Were you just trying to get cash for now to figure out what you wanted to do? Yep, okay. exactly. So what were you thinking you wanted to do? 
Um, I still thought I wanted to do something creative um, in an advertising, marketing, PR realm. Um, I also started interning very, very randomly um, with a photographer um, named Michael Cinquino. He is one of my mentors. Um, and then uh, my dear friend Jennifer Kinford, she was a makeup artist. And I started doing, like shadowing her doing makeup. Um, and that kind of led to like a little side career that I okay. had while I was also bartending and managing um, in Eat, Drink, and Be Merry. So your your dad n- was a regular at which restaurant? At was the it? Stumble Inn. The Stumble Inn. Yes. Keith Benjamin, past guest on the show. Yes. That's where he got his start? Yeah. Uh, well, maybe, he, no, I think he, upgraded. he started at Off the Wagon. So was the Stumble Inn his, I think, was that his first equity business or yeah, yeah i believe it was yeah, yes yeah. okay so yeah. he was probably there all the time all he the was place. not no? quite yet a partner or he had just been offered partner he was definitely managing at the time and and actually no he he must have been a new newish partner because he also was opening hair of the dog yeah. um in the fall of 2012 which is was. why i got hired so he got he, got he walked away from his original role to go become a manager and i think that i remember that being like a thing he's like i don't want to walk away from this money but he knew that he had a get to that next level yes yeah. yeah so then when he was asked to open hair of the dog that was like his his first restaurant that was his as as the kind of senior partner alongside his other business partner that went down with him and um he brought me along and funny enough they had asked actually asked me um mitch and michael who are the co-founders of of eat drink and be merry they asked me um, after a few months if I wanted to go down and manage down the hatch, which is their oldest bar, been around now at this point over 30 years. And I, I similarly to Keith, I was like, I, I don't think that's a good idea for me. It's, it was a basement bar in the West Village, and the staff had been there for over a decade. And I'm like, here I am in my early 20s. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down there and I'm going to start telling these people what to do right. with very very little experience in this group i was like i don't i feel like that's so not gonna go well you have in this group because this was a so like yeah like look, you start at all these different names of restaurants you started at um you didn't start it down the hatch you started at i started at the stumble in stumble Inn, yeah right. but um, they asked me if i would manage down the hatch after only a, a few months and i turned them down which i was like i don't know if this is the right idea either but i just it didn't feel right why not um, yeah, like I said, I just felt like I didn't have enough experience in the group. Um, I had only been working with the company for a few months, right. um, when I had gotten ho- people who were, were senior. Right. Yeah. And I had gotten hired on to actually go to open hair of the dog with Keith okay. when that was opening just as a bartender. Um, and I just, I, I felt like I wanted to hitch my wagon to, to him and, and to, that opportunity being offered that role only a few months into your tenure i think is a pretty big testament to your just your natural inclination towards this right uh so that's just no i mean it it seems so obvious right like that doesn't happen all the time um so you decide to go open uh stumble in no sorry hair the dog yes with uh keith yes and um how does your life start to change at this point um we open hair of the dog October of 2012, um, I, I went down there just as a bartender and within a few weeks I was starting to do some floor managing and um, I also kind of felt like if the opportunity had presented itself at Down the Hatch, then in, in due time hopefully that would happen again at Hair of the Dog if, if that was needed, right? Um, and then, yeah, for the next five years... And again, this was only supposed to be a, a, a part-time bartending job that was a means to an ev- end eventually. And um, I was, again, also doing a little bit of makeup on the side. And I started kind of making a little bit of money doing that as well. And I would be on photo shoots during the week in the daytime. And then I would go to work at Hair of the Dog at night. And this went, this really, truly went on for, for five years so until it was kind of a breaking point. So what changed? So you weren't ready to manage at um, uh, down the hat, so there's so many. Na- down yeah, the there, hatch, there, yeah. Are, there are so <laughs> many. <laughs> you weren't ready then. No, um, you decided to go open hair the dog with Keith. Yes. What changed in that period where you did become a manager? Like, how did how did being 
because it wasn't that much longer after you turned down management. No, not too much. So what changed in you or was it, what, what was different about the scenario that made you feel more comfortable about becoming a manager? I had a very close relationship with Keith. Um, I also uh, felt like since I was on the opening team that I would have gotten a little bit more maybe respect. Um, yeah. And it just, it, it, it felt like my own. I think, because I think because I opened it with them and I was, I was on that beginning team. I felt like a, a piece of it was mine, even though it wasn't. Um, I just, I kind of had that loyalty and that allegiance. And I also was kind of same thing. Like if I, graduated from college I'm not sure that I want what I want to do I want to continue to make sure that I'm growing as a human I'm learning and I'm not going to turn down opportunities going forward just because I might feel a little bit uncomfortable and down the hatch was totally different right because I didn't know anybody there I hadn't worked with anybody there how did we start today's conversation what was the quote Oh, my, my Mel don't Robbins hit. quote, the time is now. Yeah. Don't hit snooze on exactly. your life. Just start. And you, I, oh, you I was snoozing ready. my yeah. whole life <laughs> then. Smashing that snooze. I was uh, over and over and over again. <laughs> so how, it sounds like you probably grew a lot as a professional at Hair of the Dog. I did. So, Tremendously. And it sounds like being, working with somebody like Keith, did he influence you? Did he force you out of your comfort zone? Or was it just because, why did being close, you said I was close with Keith. How did being close with Keith help? He is probably, not even probably, he's the best leader I have ever met. What makes and him I've a great leader? ever worked with. Um, his passion, uh, his confidence, his ability to talk to people, um, his vision. He's, he's really, he has that, that it factor when it comes to leading people and getting people to believe in him and to believe in themselves. Got it. I love that. Um, so what did he see in you? What did, did he ever say? What, how? Oh he God, in you? I th feel like that's a question for him. <laughs> um, did he ever say like, you know, I, I think that people leave clues. He must've said, Hey, you know, Kyra, you're really good at this. Yeah. Um, I feel like I will go back to this a lot. Um, my energy for mm -hmm. one, um, my work ethic. Um, I just, uh, hospitality comes yeah. so naturally yeah. to me and I was just great customer service. Um, what is hospitality to you? Respecting the fact that people get up every day and go to work to make money for them to enjoy themselves. And I think that having that kind of respect for what people are spending their money on is exactly what hospitality is. And I think that when you go into your job every day and you remember that people could spend their money anywhere else and they're choosing, it to, they're choosing to spend it with you and to spend it on your staff and to spend it on the experience that you're providing, there's nothing better than that. Uh, I love that. So... Let's talk about how you grew. So you, when did you go from bartender manager to I'm going to take on some more responsibility around maybe was it marketing or PR? Uh, social media Got it. to start. Um, I started slowly running um, Hair of the Dogs Instagram account. Very, I mean, it, it took a while. What's um, the year? I'm sorry? What year is it at this point? Uh, I would say... 2012 2013 maybe even a little bit later 14, 14 or 15 so what what was that like what was it a challenge for you taking on the, was did you enjoy it um i loved it i think instagram i i got my instagram in in 2012 and i don't know if anybody really thought that instagram was going to be a platform to promote restaurants right. on um initially and I think as time went on and people started spending more and more time on Instagram and I personally started spending more time on Instagram, I realized like, wow, this is something that we could really use as a tool to, to bring people in the door. And honestly, I was not very good at it. I don't even know if anybody knew how to be good at it at that time, right? I go back, I'm sure you've gone back on your Instagram and you've seen pictures that you've posted in 2012 yeah. and I mean, 2013. Re reflecting back at that time, because I used to think that maybe I'd become like, I'll get into social media and become like a consultant or like that would be my niche. The more I dove into it, the more 
I think also like the platform started to evolve over time where like it was about being social. Yep. And like that was literally the advice. Yep. Talk to the camera like you're talking to your friends. Yep. Share with your, your customers the things you'd share with your friends. Yep. Yep. Make it real. Yeah. Make it sociable. Yeah. And I think over time the algorithm kind of took over. Yeah. And now it's about squeeze your life into this this little rectangle or square and like yeah. as it became more strategic and calculated i was like i'm not a calculated person this isn't for me but what are your thoughts on that? like how was the evolution for you i think that social media has totally changed changed the world right yeah, it's totally sure. it's 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 almost even changed the human nature at this point and i think that's only going to continue on and on um when we first started using instagram for hair of the dog and the and the rest of our bars um it was also kind of difficult to get the rest of the partners and at this point i was just a manager i wasn't a partner yet and it was difficult to kind of get them all to subscribe to this is something that we need to pay attention to and this is something that maybe you don't necessarily have to learn but you need to put people in place that understand it and that are going to kind of push your business to the next level yeah. because what is so smart about our group um, and especially what Mitch and, and Mikey created is offering equity to younger people and, and managers and people that you want to help continue to grow your business. That is a revolutionary idea, but to not be able to continue to adopt things that are going to continue to make us be relevant. I, it, it was confusing to me because I was like, it's really hard for, for somebody to, to learn this if it's not something that you use or, or, or do every day like Mitch or Mikey or any of the other older partners that wouldn't, that maybe have flip phones at that point. Like I have no idea. Um, But getting them to understand that, that their customer base or their business is actually now in the hands of the customer and not in your hands anymore is a really hard thing to wrap your head around. Right. So, so what do you, what, what do you exactly mean by that? By your business is in the hands of other people. You're talking about the people you're hiring to represent your business or the actual consumer? I think initially it was the consumer. Got it. And then as social media kind of take took over a new life or an, its own life, then your business is in the hands of everybody. It is definitely not just you. Because they can comment. They can the comment. They can post. They can take their they own can, photos yes. and share. Like, look yeah, how exactly. shitty or how gross this bar looks right now. Or it, like... If anything reality, and everything everybody can see it because yes. it'll be captured in that moment. yes yes yeah. and that's a scary thing right as a business owner as any business owner it's scary to realize that you're not entirely in control anymore so take us through the evolution your evolution with hair of the dog and how you evolved into i mean were you were you doing social media and bartending i'm assuming yes i was bartending managing um and when I say doing social media, it was very, very lightly. Yeah. I was posting like maybe once or twice a week. Um, again, Is at the, that uh, point, Instagram had not really... The, the posts have evolved, I'm assuming. Or oh, are my they gosh. similar to what you're doing then? Oh, no, 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 no. Totally, right, so totally different. I don't need to paint a... Make an example of what not to do anymore. Yes, no, 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 no. Like, do me a favor. Zoom up to 30,000 feet. Give me the big picture. 2014, bartending, hair of the dog, start doing social media posts. And without getting into any detail, what were the next steps in your career? Like, I'm looking at your LinkedIn profile right now. I just want to see dates and titles. I was offered partner in Uptown Social in at the end of 2017. I moved here in early 2018. We opened Uptown in April of 2018. And at that point, I was operating partner. And I was running our social media marketing PR activations alongside Keith, essentially by myself. Um, I we we very soon thereafter brought on um, my now business partner Kat Moore, and she was my sidekick. Her and I would, I mean, we made it our business to make sure that we had the best marketing, the best social media presence. Um, I mean, we were on our Instagram. 24 7 365 making sure that our voice was heard loud and clear and cat Moore was more recent the 20 she was she became a partner i, I want to say a year into uptown being open but okay, she started so managing yeah she started managing pretty soon thereafter right. she was actually my regular at hair of the dog so y- you mentioned some mentors 
Yes. And I, I want to give a tip of the hat to them because I'm assuming these mentors came into your life between 2014 and 2017. Uh, or was it later? No, I would say, yeah, for the most part. So, like, the, you mentioned the photographer. His na- I didn't catch his name, though. His name is Michael Cinquino. Michael. So, how did Michael, bring, like, w- w- how were they influential to you? When did they come into your life? Maybe it start makes sense to start with uh, Jennifer. I don't know. Sorry, who? You said Jennifer, the makeup artist? Oh, Jennifer Kinford? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, her and Michael worked together very closely. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, and she brought me on just kind of same thing as her, like, so little intern. In the timeline, when did they come into the picture? Uh, that was in, yeah, 2012. 2012. Yep. So how did they make you a better person? Um, I think they gave me a lot of confidence in something that I knew nothing about, something that I loved, something that I was passionate about, but I had no experience in. Were you in. not confident in the social media? Um, that wasn't in social media. That okay. wasn't doing makeup artistry, got it, got it, but I started posting a lot of their stuff, got it. um, started posting a lot of my own stuff. So that definitely helped me become even more creative on social media. Got it. So how did they help you with your confidence? What did that look like? Um, they, I, they gave me an opportunity to come into a space that I had no idea about and they would just, they would lift me up. They would tell me if I was doing a great job, they would correct me if I wasn't doing a great job. They were giving me all of the tools that I feel like I needed to succeed in something that again, I just didn't have any experience in. Um, and I thought that that was really, really helpful. What's the most critical tool they gave you? Mm. Really pushing it here. Oh, that's a hard one. Um, if you can't narrow it down to one. You can give me a couple. Or if you're drawing complete blanks, we can just move on. <laughs> Let, can we go back to that? Yeah, for sure. I have to think about that a little yeah, yeah, more. Yeah, for sure. Um, so you also said that they gave you confidence by recognizing what you're doing well. This is a huge lesson here. Yeah. I think we don't know what we're good at until the universe tells us. Exactly. So did you even know you had a skill for this before they started influencing you? Um, I thought a little bit just because, Your background yeah, just my, my art. background in art. You already knew you were good at putting things together. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. yeah. I, and I knew it was something that I was passionate about. And I know that we talked about this a little bit earlier, but I feel like if you really love something, you care about something, it's automatic, right? Like yeah. you're already, you already have a leg up, right? Cause you try a little bit harder. You, you spend a little more time doing it. Um, so I just knew that that was an area that I would excel in more than accounting. Got it. We're going to take a quick break to thank our sponsors. We're going to be right back to start talking about your move down here to Charleston and how you really started to evolve more as a marketer, Great. not a bartender. Great. We're back and let's get into the nitty gritty because I want to focus now on y- your story, your your evolution as a restaurant marketer. Okay. So where did it, like paint the picture of like, you kind of already did for us and you moved down here um, in 2018. I know, I remember Keith was kind of like the, the guiding compass of, of wanting to come down here. Yes. Uh, you evolved as a professional with him, as yes. working side by side with him. It only makes sense that you'd want to come down yes. with him. Yes, yes, right? yep. Um, so when you come down here, what was the narrative between you and Keith? Was he... Were you like, I'm only doing it if I get a promotion. Like, was there anything like that? Or Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, they asked me if I would entertain moving to Charleston to open Uptown. And I essentially asked if partnership was on the table or an option. Um, because I didn't really think uprooting my life, leaving New York City, leaving my friends, leaving my family without making a dis- definitive decision that this was going to be my career. I, I didn't think that that made sense. Yeah. Um, so that was that was the the question. Um, and the answer was, yeah, we'll, we'll make you a partner. So back in 2018 is when you became a partner. Yeah. Um, 2017, 2000, well, 2018 when Uptown opened. So what was that, that conversation like for you? Cause so, so to give you some context, I don't know if you caught Keith's episode. I did. Well, yeah. Did. Oh yeah. So I he he kind talking. of, you know, he was pretty transparent yes. with how it works. Like yes. you, you buy in, like yep. they don't just like say, okay, you're good at your job. Let's give you 5%. No, they gotta. You gotta put up some money. Yes, so I think this all is a criti- of it. Yeah, this is a pretty <laughs> critical part too. But, but what I like about it is that they they put it into reach. Yes, for m- most people. Yes, so mo- like most twenty four year olds can't go to the bank and get a no, million dollars, no, no. or they don't have the track record to go to friends and family and be like give me millions of dollars. But what you can do is come up with maybe a hundred thousand, right? Yeah. Um. Or you you know I think, you know if you're if you're good with money. You like most people can. I don't, like, how much? Did, like, generally, like, what is that like entry point at for most people? 
I mean, it's pretty expensive, but it, it all depends on what the space is. I mean, for a place like Uptown Social, it's 10,000 square feet. Yeah. And so, so it's a massive space versus one of our other spots in New York City, which is 2,000 square feet. But granted, then the rents are a little bit more expensive. So, so it's variable. I mean, it, it, it's variable. Yeah. But that's good. So maybe you love a company and maybe you want to be a partner in a, in a space like Uptown Social, but you don't got the green. But you don't have the cabbage to make that happen. Maybe you can go partner in a smaller or restaurant that can get you an opportunity later on i think that's kind of what keith did right um yes uh kind of the way it works though is that the idea is that you have partnership in a place that you are operating and then once you are a partner then you can kind of buy into new places or back buy into other places depending on and on do you kind of how the, the how the points are are you willing to share like the numbers that in your relationship is that something that you can talk about Okay. Yeah, no, um, no, not not specifics, but can you share ballparks generally? Kind like? of the idea. I mean, it it, it could be expensive. A, a point could be anywhere from so one percent, ten, anywhere. ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty, forty. So d- that, just depending. So talking yeah. percentages. Generally, it's you. It's a point. Yeah. You have to get at least one point, one percent. Yes. And that's relative. Or a half to, a point, or a quarter of a point. So whatever yeah. that is in your, if you're listening to this, like figure out like what a percent, and, and that's that equity in the entire business, or just like in in, the in specific spots. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Uh, I would love to know how this looks, just so we can. It is people. real. It's interesting. It's very, very it's, fascinating. It's, it's such a way, to, a beautiful way to create careers in this industry, and I think that's part of the issue is that the, the argument in this industry is that there's no career path. Right. And I think that's our fault. Because I don't know if it's greed or fear or whatever, or just re- recreating a broken model because that's all we knew. Yeah, I think that's it. Y- yeah. So like, but if, but we also bitch about how like there's no people, nobody who wants to make a career out of this. Can you blame and no people? Go- and no good people and what the staffing incentive? and right as the right. world around us evolves, right. we're still operating a 1905 business model, and right. we were like nobody wants to work. Right. Nobody wants to work for you because you're not giving them any incentive. To right. You. Right. So like, what does that look like? How do we, how do we make the industry more equitable? I mean, I would love to say just copy our business model. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> I think that makes the most sense. Right. So how do we, like, what can you give us to give us some direction of what that looks like without, cause I, I understand you can't give away. Like, I'm going to take as much as you're willing to give me. Right, okay. So give, bring so, me to what you're willing to give me. So, um, I think to your point, right? It's really hard for someone that's in their in their early twenties, mid twenties, wh- wh- whatever stage of your life, to to be able to say, okay, I'm going to invest X amount of dollars, and then I'm going to give my life to doing this, and I'm going to work 60, 70, 80, 100 hour weeks, right? Yeah. Because that's really what's expected of you at a certain point, with or without an investment. If you are running a restaurant, you it's it's you're you're committed, right? You're committed yeah. to long hours, late late nights, um, for the most part. But I think what's nice about our specific group is that you don't have to come up with the money for a full point. Maybe it's a half a point. Maybe it's a quarter of a point. We give you that option um, because some of these big numbers are really, really scary, right? Or you just can't, you can't do it. Um, and just to be clear, it's a, it's a percentage of what? It is percent... Uh, of the total equity of the of business? Of the total equity liquid, of the business. Liquid, like yes. Whatever, yes. Whatever the bank says this is worth. Yes, exactly. Got it. Exactly. Um, and, and yeah, so so I think that that's a little bit more palatable for people. So, you're, so, I, so it sounds like Michael and Mitch are basically at the top and saying, I'm going to sell you. Like, I own that point. Yes. And you're going to pay me for yes, this point. Yes, yes. Or the group owns. Yeah. The, the, the restaurant. The, 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 the 100% or the. I should say the. Where. Sorry, I, my notes are all over the place. The, oh, no worries. The name of the group is Eat, Drink, and Be Merry. Yes. So Eat, Drink, and Be Merry owns a point. Yes. You're paying Eat, Drink, and Be Merry for to own stake. You're, 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 well, you're, each. It's it, coming so off not, the table. It's not, from the, it's not from the parent group. It's it's each individual got it, restaurant. Got it, got it, got it. Thank you very much. Yes. So yeah, from yeah. There. Yeah. Um, and then also our bosses or uh, kind of the people that are that are sitting at the top, they kind of guide you, right? They they Should let you know, that the idea? save your money. Yeah. Um, yes. Kind of prepare that this this is a possibility. This could be a possibility. And we kind of start that pretty early on, right? Like if you're offered manager, you know that there's a likelihood that this opportunity will present itself at a certain point so long as you're doing a great it's job, right? It's on the table so yes. long as. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so start saving your money. Yeah. And I think this is kind of where the restaurant industry also falls short. We like it, we're very transactional in the sense like here's your paycheck, 
you know, if they offer insurance, here's your insurance. And then that's where the relationship stops. But here's how to manage your money. Yeah. We actually had a financial advisor come in last year and sit down and talk to our whole staff, whoever wanted to come and listen to just to plan ahead. Yeah. Like we're in Charleston. This is a seasonal location. You're going to make tons of money for these few months and then make sure you put enough away for the quiet. Yes. Yes. A rainy day. Young people, the school system doesn't teach people financial savvy. No, they do and not. They teach the school system was built to teach people how to be employees. Yeah, not how to manage money and create. Not money. how to be entrepreneurs. Yeah, exactly. So, like, I think it's amazing that restaurant tours. And but when you when you take the time to mold these people and to give people your knowledge and your skills and your values, they become more valuable to you. Totally. And is that kind of their their approach? Uh, yeah, I, I would say you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Um, and if you truly have a passionate restaurant person working for you and they want to go open their own place, they're going to do it. Right. You right. You might as well invest in it and, right. and, and benefit from, right. you know, their growth. Right. By giving them, by give, making it possible for them. And I would say 90% of people are not going to do this and be like, uh, I think I like working in restaurants, so I'm going to go for it. The people that are doing this are like, I love this. This yeah. is what I want to do. Dude, you just gave me an idea. Oh. Because I've been worried because I, I, I'm organized with Restaurant Unstoppable. Like, I'm not a marketer i'm not an operations person i'm not a tech geek nerd type person but like how do i evaluate the value of restaurant unstoppable right like who do i go to to say this this is what restaurant unstoppable is worth right now and then how who do i find to give me a percentage Hmm. to like help me scale this thing it would have to be somebody that would work with you right yes yeah yes you got me that's you got the wheels. Wow! Now right my now. light bulb just went on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, this is what it's all about: sharing Wait, this information. This is great. Perspective. Yeah, this what, is what, great. But do you want to share your light bulb? No, I'm just I'm I'm thinking like you could get a lot of people in the fold. Yeah, and that's totally. where I'm at right now. But th- I think we, when we don't talk about this stuff, we don't know where we don't know how to. Right. You know, and right. hopefully we're inspiring other people. Like maybe you have some team members working with you right now that you're like, holy cow! How did I end up with this person? In a good way? In a, uh, yeah, in a and good way. And in a bad way. <laughs> no, like, 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 I'm so lucky to have these people. Like, what happens if these people leave? Right. What well, that's you? that's what where the incentive so lies. The, but now there's a, a win-win situation. So there, the incentive of giving somebody equity is now you're, you're, you're getting the benefits of that person's skills. Right. But and you're not fe- just handing it out like candy, right? But, but the fear is I'm losing equity. But if you can get liquid from that, there's incentive. Now there's yes. even more incentive to do. And I think because you have to financially invest, that makes you care that much more, right? Yeah. Instead of just, just it's it's a gift or uh, it's sweat equity. Like the fact that you actually are ponying up either your money or whoever you had to beg, borrow, and steal from, it it, it changes the game. So here's how I set up my business. I use profit first. Are you familiar with that? I am not. So it just basically says you you take all the cash flow and you have five checking accounts. And all the cash flow from your business, anything you sell, any early money you, you make goes into income. Okay. And then from there, you divide it into owner's pay. Sorry. The first one's profit. Okay. Then it's tax. Okay. Because profit, the most important thing is that you take a profit from your business. Correct. The most second important thing is that you pay the government because they will shut you down. They and that, sure will. And if you don't give them, if you don't put that money aside, you're stealing. Right. It's not your money. Right. Third most important thing is owner's pay. Right. And so would that essentially be like a salary? Owner's or? pay is like, so profit is 10% that you're putting away. And right. You never touch that unless you're buying another asset to, to scale your wealth. Okay. Every 10% of every penny dollar you make goes away. You don't touch it unless it's investing in maybe 1% of a business. Okay. Got right? it. Yep. Because now you're buying an asset and assets make you money. So you're right. compounding your wealth. Right. Owner's pay is this is what I need to, to pay my bills. To live. Yeah. Pay my bills. And to like have whatever quality of life I desire. Okay. And then the rest, the, the, so from the Those top, three. income. Yes. Profit. Yes. Taxes. Owners pay operational expenses. Okay. And that, that whatever's left over. Is what you can afford to use to make this happen. Your growth. Yep. Your, and what we've always had it backwards. It's always operational expenses. And then what's left over, I take. Ah. So if you take it from the very beginning, then you the what's left over is what helps you from getting over your skis it determines growth cash flow determines growth yeah so from my so how i set that up where would would you say that the the one percent would come from owner's pay or from profit owner's pay yeah 
to dig that. Yeah, yeah, that would. Because it's a, a, a point's a point, whether it's right. a point in profit or a point in owner's pay. Right, 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 right. I like that. I hope you guys are taking notes. Yeah, this is some good notes, stuff. Everybody. This is what I was hoping to get as far as the business model and how to struct- structure this, right? So, and I would agree with you, it would come from owner's Yeah, uh, yeah. Because t- profit, you don't touch that. That's not, you, you, that, that's not exactly. yours. That doesn't belong to you. That belongs to future you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Just like and that, and honestly, that's like in my in my personal life, in my per- personal finances, that is essentially what I've done. Got it. So, any other lessons or like knowledge around this model? What about partnership agreements? How does that look? Can you, any tips and advice on how to set up those agreements? So, since I'm not personally really responsible for that stuff, that would be more of a Mitch and Mikey question. But if you Look ever want to talk to I'm them, yeah, I would, I would, I would truly recommend um, discussing it. with them yeah, because they are a wealth of knowledge when it comes to that. Since they're the ones that essentially kind of created this this idea, I'm and echo, we've just adopted. Yeah, I'm echoing the mission statement: inspire, empower, transform the industry. This is the transformative stuff. Yeah, this is the good stuff. So, um, anything that you want to get out around that now, get it out. And if not, we can move towards the marketing. No, stuff. let's move towards marketing. Okay, cool. So you said, okay, so 2017, I get offered equity in this business. Yes. I moved down to Charleston. Yes. Um, what is your title when you move here? Operating partner. Operating partner. And are, is it like set in stone that you are the marketing person? Kind of. Um, I, outside of actually bartending, serving, kind of running the floor, I didn't really know what my value add would have been in a, in a partnership realm or in an operating realm. I was an art student, a marketing PR student. I don't even know if I'd ever looked at Excel before, <laughs> before I got into the office here. I'm not even kidding. Um, I mean, I didn't know how to schedule. I didn't know how to do payroll. I, I, didn't, I truly did not know where my value add would have been. And I knew that at least this part of my brain and this part of my passion was something that I could bring to the table and that I thought that I would be good at and would be an asset. So I was like, you know what? I am going to take this as my own and I'm going to run with it. Yes. And we're going to see where that takes us. How did that conversation happen? Were they like, hey, if you want to be a partner, like you got to do more than just, you know, like. No, I think it was kind of understood because I had already as a kind of like pre-partner before we moved down here, I was still at the table talking about what we were going to do at Uptown Social. And I was sounding the alarm that social media and marketing and PR and all of this stuff was something that was necessary. So I think at that point it was like, okay, Kara's already taking this and yeah. she's running with it. So this is what she's going to do. Whether or not we say yes or no. And or we're going to benefit from it. I does. don't even know if they, I, again, I don't know if they realize because I don't think that that point yeah. they, they realized how important it was. Um, but Keith knew and Keith and I were like, we are going to be the voice of Uptown Social. And when we open in April, people are going to know about us and they're going to be following our Instagram account before that even happens. So when that door opens on April 6th, it's going to be balls to the wall. And it was. <laughs> nice. We're going to get into that. I can't wait to get into that. Um, so, I mean, I guess, yeah, like where did you start like if, if like if you're going to own this and i want to reinforce what you said um around 2017 before we get into actually how you unpackage it around 2017 2018 like even more so today i think that like the the the, the industry started becoming very competitive very i mean the early 2000s more and more restaurants were opening ever more than ever before because retail is going away the developers are just throwing money at restaurant projects there's more restaurants per capita ever before yep. uh, so there's more competition and now we're not just competition for business but competition for people yep and so we got to be better at what we do to, to you know so the cream rises to the top right so yep. that, that cream is just getting better yeah so I, I i believe my heart of hearts if you're a solo restaurateur a solopreneur or restaurateur and you are the only person that's earning profit from your business you're going to struggle so hard you to, will to find those people um and we need specialists. I like when when in the history of restaurants has a marketer owned steak in a business as could like, not like tell a you. chef. Couldn't tell like you. The marketer is becoming just as important as the chef. Yes. And and I think I want you to look at your business like this. Where like what are the key elements of my business? Front what? of house, back yep. of house, account. Yep. Th- so what keep going. Well, I, I was just gonna say 
kind of piggybacking on what you said about the competition, this is no longer about just providing a good experience and good food, right? Like people are now posting how beautiful your space is or where the location is, whether or not you're on the water or you have a rooftop or like there are so many other factors that went into what a great restaurant experience is. And prior to social media, that wasn't really the case. So I think that that also is why other people with other skill sets decided they wanted to be in the restaurant business, right? Because they could, could, they could use their skills from other industries and bring it into restauranting. And it's not just about the food and the experience anymore, which I thought was kind of interesting. And I think that that's what we've kind of focused on um, in promoting Uptown and then now Sharehouse Bodega and now back promoting our, all of our places in New York and Chicago. I love it. So you cover, uh, that's one thing I did want to come out. You're not just focusing on Uptown. No. Or, and like these three groups that are right, these restaurants nope. that are right here. Nope. Like, the whole business is your baby now. Yeah. And when um, did that To a happen? degree. Um, within the last year. Okay, cool. So we'll shelf that. So 2017, you're like, damn it, I'm taking over the social media. Thing. This is <laughs> mine. I, this is going to be my baby. Get out of my way. Where did you start? Um, by making an Instagram handle, <laughs> um, a Google business page. Um, we also did hire um, a team to do our branding because we knew that that was really, really important. Gone are the days of just like hiring someone off the street to create a logo. Like, I mean, at this point, there's like brand packages. And um, when we got Anthony Falco, who created our pizza menu on board, he had a big name. And I think this wasn't just about social media, right? It's about what can you create within your bar, restaurant, your brand that you can then promote, right? What came first, the chicken or the egg? So we had to decide to come up with ways to actually promote Uptown and what people were going to find interesting. Collaboration. Yes. So this is, um, in the world of podcasting, this is a lot of how restor- a podcast scale. They they find other podcasters that are in their realm of, you know, relative to their subject matter, and they say, hey, can I come on your show, and I'll have you on my show, and I'll promote you, and you promote me, and then what ends up happening is you're, you pick up followers from those right. people. Right, right. So is that your, what, what would we call this? What's the technical term for this? I, I think collaboration. Okay. Collaboration, cross-promoting. So you're, so the, what you said is, um, what can we create that we can promote? So uh, it was creating kind of a one-stop shop for an experience, right? We started thinking about, A, the aesthetic. And Mitch and Randy built the whole place out, and it's so beautiful. And we're like, okay, where can we find moments where people are going to want to take pictures? Where can we, I mean, with the name Uptown Social, there's so much that we can do with it. We did Social AF. We did Uptown Girls, Socialite, Social Climbing. Like, we, we started to pick and choose ways to creatively get our brand out there. Um, we started hiring different graphic designers to make our promotions a little bit more professional. We, um, started booking all different types of entertainment. We just wanted to make an experience that was both enjoyable inside of our building and also enjoyable across different social media platforms. Let me make you drill down a little bit more. You're dropping a lot. I'm trying to keep up with my Oh, sorry, sorry. No, you're doing great. Should I go a little bit slower? No, no, no. (laughs) This is all gold. So uh, I just kind of like, so... I love, so you're okay. What's out there uh, that might have a presence that, it's like a Venn diagram. What do we need and how can what we need also slingshot us ahead with their presence? Kind of like, you know, like we need. Within within a restaurant, what do you need? You need, you need great food. All right. A great good food. location. I mean, there are so many things, right? But I'm just thinking from like a, a marketing standpoint, how do you, how do you promote something well is you have to have food that looks really good and then also has to taste good, right? Yeah. Um, you need to have a logo that's aesthetically pleasing. Um, you need to have a brand package that is interesting, that is creative. Um, you need to have different slogans or phrases or sayings that people can relate to and recognize your business by um for us like our social butterfly we had an artist paint 
a beautiful butterfly that people were going to take pictures in front of. Okay, so here's another way to look at it. To help, to, so I'm starting to get. So basically, anything you create has to go through a filter of how can we promote. Yes. If we're going to create it, what, how do we promote this? How does it perceive? What the end product is perception. Yes. How can we position this creation in a way to be be intentionally perceived on the other side? Yes. And then how does the user look at that and generate their content? for your business. And then how does the user look at that and generate the content for the business? Yes. Okay, so, so we're not only relying, and this is going back to what we were talking about earlier, it's in the consumer's hand at this point. So if you give them the opportunity to promote, if you give them something that's cool enough, that's fun enough, that's exciting enough, they're going to do the work for you. So get into that. Answer that question. How does this that thing that we're creating be perceived and how do they promote it? What, is, what are the things we can do to make things more naturally promotional? This is something that has come a long way for us in the last five years. And I think that is building a team and making sure that you are continuing to keep people that are relevant, that have their finger on the pulse at that table. Because it's sad for me, but I'm no longer promoting Uptown Social for myself, right? I'm 36 years old. I just got married three weeks ago. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Um, but we're, our target demographic is 21 to, I mean, call it 36, fine. But have like, you, Have you aged out of your demographic? I feel like I, feel like I have. I, I'd like to it's think just, no, but I mean, listen, I like to still go out and have fun. But, <laughs> but no, but like getting, getting – getting our, our younger staff at the table and giving them a voice, right? Okay, so I was curious. When you said at the table, I was like literally like literally, guests? Literally, yes. So, like, <laughs> so, keeping, so getting guests at the table and then keeping them at the table. Yes. What do you mean by, like yes. literally, what do you mean by keeping them at the table? So I think that getting our younger staff members who work specifically at Uptown Sharehouse Bodega, at, at, any, of our, at any of our restaurants at our group, um, I think giving them a voice is really important. Um, I especially think that this generation, the, the generation that we're targeting, um, they really like to have a voice. They have a lot of opinions, right? They're also very savvy. They know what they're doing on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, all, all of these platforms where we're promoting on and they're promoting for us and our customers are promoting for us. They know what's going on. So you have them at the table and you have them come up with ideas and give them the opportunity to kind of take ownership as well, even if they don't have equity, right? A lot of our, our, our employees are young. They're in college still, but they love this place like it's their own, and they want to promote it like they're, it's their own. And when Uptown has a bad review or if somebody posts something and they're upset with their experience, they get personally offended by it, and they want to figure out how we can be a little bit better to make sure that that doesn't happen right. again. So we started this rabbit hole with the idea of how does the user i.e. the guest promote how do you make everything that's been diagram everything you create has to go through this filter of how is this going to be perceived and promoted on the back end so tying that thought with building a team so i think when we build a team they know what's relevant. They know what's going to work. They know what our consumer is going to promote because Why? they're because they're the, they the consumer. The they're the demographic. Yeah. So we could have me and a bunch of other late thirty, early forty year olds sitting at a table. We don't necessarily know what the twenty two year olds are interested in posting, right? Yeah. They're not posting what we'd be posting. You're totally making me warm fu and fuzzy on the inside right now. Because, um, I mean, so as you grow a business, you try things, and then the only way you're going to know if it works or not is by trying it. Correct. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes right. there's a variable you didn't take into consideration, like bandwidth or interest in doing the thing. Yep. Right? So I, I recently experienced this with Restaurant Unstoppable um, because I launched Restaurant Unstoppable Network. And what, that was my way to provide some kind of community around Very the podcast. Cool. But Congrats. I do not like to exist online. There's a reason why I get in my car and drive everywhere. You know, like I like to do this. Like right. I could be easily talking to you on Zoom, and we could have done this weeks ago. Right. And, you know. No, I love this. Exactly. I love and this. And I do too. And this, and this is what I. This is my vision. This is what I love. This is, and I can't sacrifice this. And this is what makes me happy. But I can't do this 
and be digital. You know, I mean, I could, but I also don't like that. Right. You know, so like, and I'm not good at the atten- I'm dyslexic. I, I, I write things funny and like things <laughs> come out. Like I'm so, so self-conscious about it, you know, like, to so the point where like everything that I'm doing, I'm like, this looks like crap. Like I'm not like you in the sense that I can't design and make things look pretty and appealing digitally. I don't represent myself well digitally unless I'm talking, <laughs> you know, so well, you do an incredible job of thank- talking. So, <laughs> so like, so like recently the thought, and I'm just trying to use an example of how this manifests in different verticals. Right. So of as far as like like letting your team so talking to my hopefully new community manager so so the idea is i'm getting out of that lane finding somebody else to manage this so i can do what i do best right and you can only do so much anyway right yeah exactly so the idea behind the network going forward is like let's create a minimal viable product and we bring in the people who were the most active when we first started and say what do you want us to create they're the end user right so like how do we reverse engineer what the community needs and wants I think you you just said it. Yeah. You just said it. It is having, well, first I would say having a community manager that knows what you're doing, what you're trying to do, knows your product, knows your brand, knows, knows your consumer, and kind of is your consumer. I think that that's really, really helpful, right? Yeah. Because most of our employees at this point are are our consumer. I mean, some people have been here for five years and are a little bit older now, but like in general, the people that we want to come inside are the people that are working here and they know how to relate to them. Who was working here? I would say mainly college kids to young adults, 25, 26, 27. Does that work in every business model? So say I'm fine dining white tablecloth. I would say no. Why? Because that's not the experience of 20 to a 28 year old is looking for so if i'm doing you know moderately expensive maybe not white tablecloth but like you know elevated food heavy wine program uh heavy food experience not necessarily sports or like socializing right but you're there to like get a food experience maybe does it make sense to hire people i don't know who are passionate about that sort yes. of thing yes or maybe someone who's a little bit more I don't know. Refined. I'll say older, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like and yeah, refined. Mature, yeah, you know, like you're not you're seasoned. not hiring you're not hiring a, a 21 year old. Well, first of all, I mean maybe you're on TikTok, but probably not, right? Because that's not really the demographic that yeah. you're trying to target. I would say, in a fine dining establishment, like yes, you definitely do need a social social media presence, but your your demographic is totally different. So I guess what I'm just getting at is is this approach that you're taking unique to the the business model or the 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 I guess the the type of demographic you're going after? I don't think so. I think I think the same type of model works really probably for anywhere, um, but I think that you have different people that you have at the table. Got it. Um, cool. So, okay, al- along this note of like how does the – any other thoughts around how does the user promote the, the product, the, this approach that you're taking? I think when, when we first opened Uptown – Again, this was five years ago. Um, I had, I still have my finger on the pulse. I'm still here all the time. I'm still operating uptown specifically, um, but I know what goes on here: share house, bodega. And when we initially decided that we were going to do this huge activation push, we really, really focused on the energy of the building and getting our voices out there. And we wanted to make sure that people understood the energy and they understood the excitement. And I think we very carefully made that happen and then people started to do the same thing for us and then as time went on we started to create more and more opportunity for people to start painting pictures we updated the space we came up with more and more clever ideas and again we have a table of anywhere from 10 to 12 people every single week whether it's at a manager meeting or at a social media and marketing meeting coming up with constant ideas some we shoot down some we're like that's a great idea we also take a lot of inspiration from other places that we admire how often do you have marketing every single week every week there's a marketing every week. single week we also are on a text message chain we're on an email chain just the marketers uh, just a marketing meeting every week. We do a marketing me- meeting every week, and we have operating partners there. Sometimes we have managers there. Sometimes we have um, we invite staff to come if they want to come. If they have great ideas, we ask them to email us ideas. Um, we talk about this stuff very, very thoroughly. Do you guys use EOS? 
the entrepreneurial the entrepreneurial operating system we as far d- as like how to like host your meetings no I was just curious. we send out we send out an agenda yeah. no <laughs> on, on a, on, on if Google. you said yes i would have been really I was like i'm not sure what that is it's it's a it's, uh, it's something that i'm trying to implement here at restaurant stoppable with my internal team but okay. it's basically just an operating it's it's eos stands for entrepreneurial operating system so a restaurant has systems it has like systems on like recipes on how right, to make the POS food, and how to yeah. bring somebody to the table, right? Like standard operating procedures, right. Yep. right? yep. But like, what what does that all live on? What's the foundation? It, like the things like how does this get? How does information flow? You know, like so like weekly meetings, annual meetings, uh, like establishing goals for the quarter and the strategies to reach like how, what is what's all that ours is actually slightly antiquated at this point because it's really via email text yeah, and check out and eos i'm telling google you, docs the, the i will traction can i write things yeah, down yeah 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 it's, it's a game oh no change. i don't have a pen oh that's right that's all right uh, we'll, we'll, make we'll sure. talk after we'll make offline sure. but like anyway i was just because the importance of regular communication right but also how to get the most out of those meetings Right, um, right. So it's not just people going down rabbit holes. So right, like, that's right. Kind of like, and we, so we do have an agenda. Danny, who is my intern, who is now, um, she's actually moving to New York, but she um, she started as just a, a marketing intern um, a couple of years ago, and now she is um, an our in house event coordinator, and she does like tons of our activations and our marketing, and she sends out the agenda. She's extremely organized, and she kind of keeps us um, from not going down those rabbit. I mean, we still do it times yeah. but uh she's she keeps us on the straight and narrow yeah so take me into wh- like what like the things that you would discuss in a weekly meeting like what like what are the things you're looking for uh we will go day by day and we will talk about what we want to promote on instagram on tiktok on facebook on google business um we will talk about any entertainment we have for that week why the entertainment worked why it didn't work if we want to bring them back um we will discuss what kind of um specials what kind of promotions that we're looking to do what kind of events we might have going on that week or the next week or the following week um i mean it is a long thorough meeting so one thing i i mean is, should we s- keep going down this path of weekly meetings or like is there more to like this big picture? We talked about team building, bringing your team to the table, uh, people understanding like being intentional with the energy of the building, uh, meaning like every space has like the, we're sitting right here. There, there's cameras rolling behind Kara. You see, you know, like people having fun in your space. Yes. Uptown social branding. Yes. So no yes. matter where you are, any, any angle of me you will know where I am. Yes. Is that yes, what you're saying? Yes. Yes. So like filling the space with branding. Yes. No filling what. it with branding. And again. Also people doing what you want to see people do. Yes. Yes. Which is another cool thing. I want to do a walk around with you, but like it isn't just like a picture of like the, so, like the social butterfly wall. It's a picture of the social bu- butterfly wall pe- with people behaving the way you want everyone to behave. Yes. So and how we want people to take pictures see, and how we want do. them to promote. Exactly. So is it, is it sub, subliminal in a sense um i uh yes and no it's not dirty yeah i mean because you're not getting to do uh, it's 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 calculated right it's definitely calculated and again i don't even think that we knew at first to do this i think as time has gone on and we've seen the behaviors and we've seen what people are doing we're like oh that's a great promotional moment how do we do this again and again and again and again i mean this also kind of makes me wonder again because like i i go like does this approach work with every concept because i think about like a like a fig or the ordinary right are you familiar with these yeah yeah yeah, of course like i haven't actually i I have to admit i've never been in them but i would based off of what i understand there's probably not like their logo everywhere no, definitely not. Yeah, it's pr- a little more elevated. Like you're in like a, a very private setting. Maybe you almost feel like in someone's house or something like yep. that. So is this unique to your, like, you know where I'm going with this? Like, yeah. can, can everyone execute this or are you guys in a special space? I guess when you put or, it like that, maybe we are. Or is art, no offense, you know, Mike Rada and, you know, all these amazing people that are over there. But like, is that just the old way of doing things? And they, have they not figured out the code? I mean, they've had tremendous success, right? So like, who am I to talk yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tr- truly, that. truly. And I'm just playing devil's advocate right now. No disrespect to what those gentlemen have achieved. Um, I think yes, it works for us. We're 
it's a little bit more specific uh, based off of our clientele and what we're trying to a- accomplish. Um, but they have figured out PR and marketing in their own right, in right. their own space. And this is, so what we're talking about right now, Kara, is exactly why I've gone fucking crazy over the past 10 years. Because my goal when I started this thing was, I'm going to find the answers. There's only going to be one answer for every vertical, obviously. There's only one answer. <laughs> there are only, only one only answer. One and truth. the internet is right about everything. There's only one. There can only be one truth. <laughs> The more I learn, the more I realize that we live in a very complex system. Yes. And what's true for you might not be true for yes. somebody else. Yes. And this is one of the things that drove me quite crazy. One of the reasons why I was so quiet for so long as far as sharing opinions, because like I, I don't know enough about you in your restaurant, in your strengths, in your weaknesses to give you honest feedback. You know, like, and I'm not gonna sit down in five minutes and tell you what to do with your business because it might not make sense for you. Right. So that's kind of why, like, I, th- I think we focus so much on like we're just here to learn your perspective. So, right. so what, if you're saying things or if, if Kara's saying things that might not work in your business model, then take elements of it that might, you know, like you can still bring your team to the table and give them a voice. No, I think that's the number one thing that I've learned in the last five years. Being a boss is listening. Yeah. So <laughs> number there, one, are there any other like really cool things like as far as your evolution goes? I don't know if we've gone like way down into this rabbit hole of like your like every little detail or is there more that we haven't touched on that you want to bring to the conversation or should we talk about your evolution as a marketer in, in I don't think social? so I would just say take everything as a learning experience and a learning opportunity and constantly do research um, because the age of promotion is ever changing um, and I think as time goes on it's just that's going to continue to do that and you're not going to be an expert in in everything age of promotion is constantly changing yeah. So where is promotion today versus where it was in 2017? I think in 2017, I'm, you're promoting a little bit on the internet, but people were not paying attention to it in the same way. Um, people were definitely not using social media in the same way. Um, I think that it was a lot of print ads. It was uh, some digital, some radio. Are we but talking about back when you were in college or 2017? I mean, to, uh, well, 2017, it was... It, it was more so than in 2012, but not to the extent of what it is now. Elaborate on that. I'm not fully sure. So I don't know if I'm picking up exactly what you're pointing out. So like the, bef- the, like the before landscape Uptown, is changing. Yeah. Like before Uptown opened in, in 2017, our partners that had been in, in the business for 25, 30 years, they weren't thinking about Instagram, right? They they had They had no idea. But then somebody like me yeah. I was like okay like we have to be on the forefront of this like yeah. we have to start using this as a platform to promote I mean this is only going to get so what are the young whippersnappers the the new age carrots it's all TikTok now so what and I don't saying? even under, really understand TikTok so what that are they well. telling you what have you what it, like where was your TikTok game when you first created uh, an uptown social account and where is it now it, it we actually hired Danny um, and we have two other girls here at Uptown that both started, one started as a host. Actually, both of them started as a host and one's a server. They're yeah. both in college. They go to College of Charleston. We were like, you guys are going to run our TikTok. You tell us what to do. You tell us what to do. And what have they told you? So much. So, 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 so much. Um, I mean, truly had to target, target them. Um, how... Uh, People have like an eight second attention span at this point and then they move on. So how do you target them? Exciting videos, comedy, um, promoting staff, kind of letting them be the voice now. Um, For us, I mean, we still want to capture the energy of the building. So like consistently putting up our entertainment, bands djs i I mean you're we're promoting similar stuff but just in a new and exciting way you're telling Um, a story with clips almost yeah yeah and and five years ago you were posting pictures right you're posting beautiful pictures yeah but that that has changed now it's it's all video right Right. um and now it's learning how to edit and splice and i mean look at look at what you have yeah yeah but this is not something that i think back in in 2017 anybody would have thought like okay i'm going to start making 
funny blooper videos of of our staff to get people in the door or to get right. people to follow us. Hon- you know, ironically, I, I argue that that should be one of the the strategies that Restaurant Unstoppable uses because I'm such a knucklehead <laughs> and I'm doing dumb shit all the people, time. People, people love it. The <laughs> our, our two things that like get the most traction is um, staff bloopers. And very randomly renovations. Yeah. I don't know why, people but like to people it. love uh, to yeah. see it before and after. Yeah. Um, anything we haven't talked about? I mean, I'm looking at the time. I know you have a busy day today. You have some people coming in that you have to make yourself available for. Um, we, I did want to talk about influencer marketing and events because I know that is a big part. Yeah. That's a big yep. part of your strategy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you get into that before we move on? Yeah, we actually just... Um, kind of recently, more so in New York, um, because I think that the influencer marketing game is uh, far more professional in New York. We also hired on um, a PR team that we work with called Bread and Butter, um, which is actually new. We did not work with a PR team. We I did know them. everything in-house. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love them. Yeah. Rachel, who's the CEO, oh, yeah. she is the coolest. I'm sure if I looked up Rachel's email or Rachel's name, I would probably have a couple clients yeah she's she's great she's brilliant her team is incredible um so we started using them as well because also and and again i think we we talked about this a little bit too but you're only a professional in in certain aspects right and you need to bring other people on that know what they're doing and from a pr standpoint like yeah we understand public relations we understand promotions we we know what, what we're doing but we don't necessarily have the connections and or the bandwidth to like really get ourselves out yeah. there I'm, right I, I think that what you're doing is absolutely what a restaurant needs to do i also think it's a problem because what ends up happening is all the power gets in the hands of these publicists and unless you can afford to work with certain publicists and leverage that relationship with whatever outlet i.e i don't know food and wine or what uh, leisure thrillist whatever magazine consumer facing magazine you want to get it hinges a lot on relationships and it's pay to play so is yeah. that a fucking issue yeah Part of my language yeah um yeah i would say i would say this so. is exactly why i try to avoid publicists at all costs and i drive around the country and i say hey kara who do you respect and admire because i don't want those companies to steer the ship right you know and I, it's weird it's like the more this is one of the earlier the more i learned about marketing and i figured it out and i cracked the code of it i'm like i don't think i should do this it's do you, do so bread and butter, I think, is actually a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe it's just Charleston's a little bit different, too, because they have more of a personal relationship with us. And our account managers are same thing, like two young girls that come into Uptown, come to Share House, go to Bodega. Um, so I think that they have a, a more of a personal relationship with us. So so their goal is kind of aligned with our goal. Got it, got it. Um, and Rachel also, she approached us. She actually said that she followed us on social media and she was really impressed and she wanted to yeah. sit down and have a conversation with yeah. us, which I took as the biggest form of flattery, right? Yeah. Because for somebody like her to compliment us like that, I just, I, I was, I was, really really just kind of over the moon with with that so when we are doing influencer marketing uh when you're thinking about the people that you're going to collaborate with i.e djs i.e i don't know bands like who are some of the other people that come in here that would be an influencer or so that's actually where bread and butter has been really really helpful especially in new york because i think it is a little bit hard to navigate um what influencers are kind of the real deal and what you're actually going to get out of of that influencer because we've made that mistake plenty of times at uptown social where i'd be on our instagram and i'd be following people and i'd reach out thinking like okay said person has twenty five thousand followers let's give them a free dinner and a night out on uptown and ask that they do a few posts and all of a sudden nobody shows up to the influencer event they have all fake followers i didn't do my due diligence to figure out if they're they're the real deal or not and now we've spent money that we don't necessarily want to spend or have on somebody that's kind of illegitimate and we got nothing out of it the the pictures weren't great nobody followed us nobody reshared a a picture or a post or whatever it might be so bread and butter has the connections with actual true influencers that will promote us in a way and get us on on They've uh, done the work to for know you who, page. who's professional, yeah. who's going to create the win-win situation yeah. for you. Yep. Um, I mean, any other advice that we haven't discussed yet as far as how you're doing your marketing today that you think 
is beneficial to our listeners. Oh, geez, we've we've, we've covered, covered a lot. so much. Did um, I put too much pressure on? I feel like I kind no, of no, 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 no. It's so I hard just, for you to talk about marketing sometimes without saying. I'm not even sure. Like, I don't want to keep repeating myself, um, or even repeat myself. Um, I think a couple of things, and this is still kind of in the 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 marketing but operations realm. I think always responding to reviews is a huge one, and I think a lot of restaurants fall short in doing that. Um, when somebody leaves you a rev- review, whether or not it's good or bad, that's if you ignore it, that's like ignoring somebody that walks into your restaurant at yeah. this day and age. Yeah. So I, I really, that's that's one thing. So, sorry, keep going. No, 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 no. that's that's one thing. Um, Google Business also, I think, is a huge one. Promoting, there's like a little thing on Google Business where you can put graphics or events or write little comments or blurbs or write-ups about what you have going on that week, that month, that year whatever it might be and I think that's a really really underutilized thing as well because when people are looking up best bar in Charleston and Uptown Social comes up with like a little post tonight's entertainment is x y and z getting your message out there on as many platforms as you can I think is really really important and making them slightly different or tailored to each individual kind of target audience you're trying to reach yeah it's so crazy how much work there is to do to be able to stand out today and i feel like that we live and correct me if i'm wrong i feel like we live in a world that if you're if you were a restaurateur and you focus on everything that's in the four walls of your business i.e anything that's not digital right but just like good service amazing food uh warmth and generosity and hospitality and amazing aesthetic like all the things the physical things that before 2010 were the if you could do all the all those things amazingly and say there's a competition that does everything uh, but they're so good at marketing promotes it really well yeah but they're so good at marketing and like they could get better business in today's age because it people put so much emphasis on that but at the end of the day i feel like if you drive people to your business because you are good at marketing and you get like a 3.5 average rating on Google or something like that, it won't sustain. Agreed. You, you need both. You need both. You cannot yeah. market. You can't be the best marketers in the world with the best branding and the most exciting energy on TikTok and then walk in here and provide a bad experience because right. you will not survive. Right. So the mission statement is to inspire empower and transform the industry as a marketer as the as having a very good understanding of how the game is played was there anything you'd change about it if you could if you could make the world a better place and knowing what we know about the world we live in is there anything that you would change i feel like this is going to be like like where are we interesting, headed, right? interesting advice. Where um, are we headed, and where would you rather we go? Because I, because I know how important it is, but I sometimes feel like you, ha- you have to put your phone away. You have to. You, social media is great and um, has changed the game and has made our businesses so much better, um, both online and actually in person, which is amazing. But Remember that you still need to have those actual experiences and it can't all be through your phone or your computer. Um, and that's, that's, that's a tough thing for somebody who this is my full-time, this is my full-time it's, it's, job. Yeah, this is my bread and butter. Standard. This is how, how I make my money. Yeah, right. Yeah. But on one end, I, I love to see people come in and take pictures and videos all night of, of what we're doing here. That's yeah. like, it shows that what we're doing is working, but I also want to just be like, take, take a few minutes also to put did your phone in your pocket and just enjoy the experience. Yeah. Did it happen unless it happened on Instagram or TikTok? Did it actually happen? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's the mentality people are taking nowadays. You know what I mean? And I only think it's going to get worse. So as long as you can, um, what do you mean by worse balance? I, I think people are going to get more and more fixated on their phones and less fixated about I, the experience. I realize I'm putting you in an awkward space here, but I know. do you think that there's a social responsibility? People are going to hate talking to me. About oh, you. I'm, I'm going to burn every bridge I go a to. A social about. responsibility to Knowing do what? Knowing what you know about the adverse effects of social media and being in your phone all the time and capturing stuff and not putting the phone away and just being present. No. Okay. No. 
Um, because I think that humans are responsible for their own behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you feel yourself getting too kind of zoned in on your phone and you're not experiencing the world around you, that's on you. Yeah. I, I agree with that statement. Um, I will, I mean, in defense of humanity, I think that not, I think operate like business owners and people like yourself have to, this is what we have to do. To we survive. have to use the tools, right? I because everybody else is. Here's where the social responsibility lies. In my opinion is with the companies that make these things because their, their focus isn't on you and you benefiting you. Their primary objective is eyes on my p platform. Right. The more, time people are looking at my platform the better i'm doing and that's the only thing they care about right and right. the data that they're collecting too. right so i feel like i don't think that technology is going away or or digital marketing is going away what i would encourage people the message i would like to get out there and i would love to hear your opinion on this is check out some other platforms mm -hmm. there's yeah. a there's there are a whole new wave of next generation social platforms that exist to actually do what the original social platforms were created right do. right that's tough for me too because I'm like I don't want to so learn. Energy. I don't, don't want to learn anymore. Exactly, I totally get it. But I, there's there's a gr a bunch out there that are trying to decentralize the experience. Yeah, uh, Minds. I think it's called Minds is one of them, and it's like it's the decentralized social platform where like it's interesting. What does that even look like? I don't know. Like a social like, platform to decentralize social platforms. It's just basically. I think the idea is like they're they're there to just to to make it about people connecting and sharing information and it's not about marketing or advertising it's about connecting people right you know like right. I, like when facebook was created i don't think that mark, mark zuckerberg had this grand vision i mean that was other people influencing and being like you can make money doing this right you know and that's what it became about right um so i think that and it's also for me it's kind of scary that three companies run the show i know facebook I know. which owns twitter i know tiktok and google and doesn't facebook own instagram also Sorry, I meant to say Instagram. Um, Elon Musk owns Twitter. Um, but four, okay? So maybe four companies. So, like, may, those are the big dogs. So, like, is it, what, like, is that, is that healthy? Right, right, <laughs> like right, right. Four companies. Carry, right. Like, literally four companies are, and in your words, social media has changed human behavior. It has. Four companies are s completely responsible for the way people interact and exist on this Yeah, planet. yeah, that is, that is a scary thought. That is, is a scary thought, especially. It's a lot of power. Yeah, it's a lot of power. So I know people must hate me right now because, like, I just like, I, I'm like, give me all of your information <laughs> about this. And, and you're like, wait a second. Now I feel horrible. Yeah, for doing no, it. no more social but media, no like, more marketing. I, like, I'm open. The I'm open. I want to learn more because, I, like I said, I, I, it's necessary. But at the same yeah. time, I think we need to be conscious. Yeah. I think we. Need but to the be thing about marketing conscious. specific to to our group is like, yes, I want to make sure that. Uptown, like myself, Keith, Kat, our whole partnership, we want to make our spots look as exciting as possible. But what we really, really, really want is to provide a great experience. So yes, if we can get it out there so people know that, that's the goal. Of course, we want the place to be busy, but I want you to come inside and I want you to have a great drink. I want you to have a great slice yeah. of pizza. I want you to enjoy whatever band that we've booked. I want you to party with the DJ. I want you to have light up cat ears on and like I want you to wake up the next yeah. morning and be like I just had the most fun ever yeah and there is a giant silver lining to this too that I don't think gets brought up like social media and marketing has become so important that it is creating an incredible opportunity for people people like yourself who have a natural inclination to this and people like Thank the you. interns that you've hired so it is it is spinning in a world where we're losing the AI, <laughs> you know. I don't even do like, <laughs> like, like in who like maybe we're. I don't know. I just feel like create AI still. I mean, even this I feel like is like they they struggle it struggles with creativity. But that I feel like I can retract that statement as of recently. They're doing some pretty amazing things. The thing that AI is going to do is going to make someone that might not naturally be that great at marketing or that creative they're gonna even the playing field so yeah. it's just gonna make it m that much more difficult for but let me ask you this sorry Ooh, it's gonna no, make no, it no, that much ahead. more difficult for finish your sentence i'm sorry <laughs> see that's cat oh, that's cat right. this is our this is our other marketing girl <laughs> As I bash social media, I'm smiling <laughs> for the camera. I know he is bash bashing <laughs> social media. I'm like, I don't know how I got here. No, no, <laughs> no I'm, I'm kidding. I just tried. I'm like, kidding. We learned a lot, and everything you shared was incredibly. But I, I just, 
I just like to talk about because I think there needs to be balance to the conversation because not enough people. Everyone's so concerned about learning more so we can stay relevant that we're we're almost like add the blinders on. Yeah, but it's it's scary because how much control do we have to your point, right? Like uh, if, if it were up to me, I wouldn't necessarily want to be, and I know I can speak for Keith too. Like we don't want to be on our phones all the time, seeing what everybody else is doing and constantly being like, okay, how can we be better? Who can we book? Yeah, like, that, I, do you ever get anxiety around fear of relevance? Um, no, but I definitely find I get much more, much more easily distracted. Um, I feel like, I'm abusing your time right now. I'm looking at the clock. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Um, I feel like humans can't really multitask anyway, and I I find being on your phone makes it that much harder. Um, I feel like I'm just, I feel like I'm just constantly distracted because you're overwhelmed and overstimulated, and there's so much information, and you don't necessarily know what's right or what works, and like everything's a flash in the pan, and it's just like, so maybe I don't consciously have anxiety, but probably subconsciously. Right. It's funny, Sam. I don't know if you met Sam. He was here with us. He was helping me on the road. I think maybe very briefly. And he has to constantly hear me complain about social media because he's trapped in a car with me for a week. And I'm also really bad about constantly checking to see what people are saying. He's like, for somebody who hates social media so much, you're awful. And you seem to be really into it. I'm like, this is why I hate it. Well, be- And it's 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 your livelihood. Yeah, I'm it's like, so important. This is important. the biggest reason why yeah. I hate it. Because like, I have horrible ADHD. I pick up my phone to like check something. And then 20 minutes later, I'm like, why am I here? Yeah. I'm like the, the most vulnerable to social media. No, I, I think but. I think most people most people are unless you make a conscious decision not to be. And for somebody like you or somebody like me, like it's it's imperative to our business yeah. and to our livelihood to make sure that we're remaining relevant and paying attention. Right. And that, that and that can be hard. Yep. So I mean, back to the, the silver lining is that I think that this that this importance of the the world of digital has o- opened a lot of opportunity for people. And uh, obviously, the, the the ability to get knowledge and information out is another great silver lining. So it's not all doom and gloom. I just think it's like giving a, a baby a lighter. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it's this is a new thing, and we just don't know how to use it yet. I think over time, we're gonna like just like uh, how um, when like processed food became a thing, we became fat and gross <laughs> overnight <laughs> because we d- it's like we didn't know how to manage right, it. Right, right, you know? right. And over time, we're like, well, this isn't good for us. Right. And then we figure out better ways. Yeah, no, I, and I think that that will inevitably happen. And there's going to be yes. some people that there, there's going to be a price to pay, right? Just yeah. like anything. But yeah. so I'm in search we'll for there. those better ways. Yeah. And I hope that we get them out there. And I, but marketing's not going away. No, it's not. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's it's been around for forever it's right. just gonna it'll it'll shift and change is there anything we did not discuss anything that we're hoping to get out now is the time i don't know right. what else i don't do you have any other questions no i think we're gonna take a quick break to thank our sponsors okay. and we're gonna come back and bust out a speed round great it's uh 12 16 uh, that's right that's fine okay Oh my gosh, does it sound okay? I don't even know. What's that? Does, do I sound you okay? Sound I don't awesome. even know. Are you sure? No, here's the thing. Like, <laughs> Restaurant South Pole gets praised for being the real. Right. You know, I'm right. not trying to, like, bait and switch. I'm not trying to click funnel somebody. No, right it's now. so fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just want to make sure that I'm giving no, you guys amazing. good information. It's, it's a great conversation. Thank cool. you. Cool. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. With, wait, sorry. I almost started the podcast. <laughs> I almost started with excitement. <laughs> oh, we're doing it all over again? <laughs> All right, <laughs> we're back, and the first question I have for you is, what is your it factor, a habit, a trait, a characteristic you believe most contributes to your success? My energy. What is your biggest weakness? Time management. Mm, I get that one. How are you overcoming it? Uh, I just, I, I make a lot of lists. I try really, really hard to... I was going to point at the list, but you beat uh, me to it. Yeah, yeah, no, I have lists. I, I mark things off. Um, I, I set timers. I set alarms. Like, I I really, really try. I, I pay attention to how long things actu- actually take me because I think right. that's my biggest problem yeah. is I under-promise and, or over-promise, under-deliver when it comes to my time. When you're growing your marketing team, what things are you looking for? Like, when you're hiring or just generally hiring? I don't know if you're a part of that. Um, yes, I am. Uh the, the first thing I look for is um, whether or not this person has any idea um, about the job, about Uptown Hospitality Group, about Uptown, Sharehouse, Bodega, parent company. I want to see if they've done their research. Um, I think that's huge, knowing what they're marketing, what they're, what they're getting themselves into. Um, I think that just s- shows a level of professionalism. Um, I also look for 
great communication skills. Um, yeah, those would be my two things. What's your biggest challenge today? I've talked a lot about this. Um, just the, our demographic, um, this generation. Um, I sometimes feel like they forget that this is a job um, and they don't necessarily take it quite as seriously um, or act as responsibly as they should when it comes to this being a place of employment. Um, and I think that's hard. I think um, there's just a, a certain level, like uh, in some ways, um, being a boss I think is, is great and being a leader is great. Um, sometimes I feel like I have to set boundaries and they don't necessarily always respect those boundaries. Um, yeah, and I'm not even sure sometimes how to navigate that. Interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm tempted to pull back layers, but I also feel like I need to respect your privacy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think just working with a, a little bit of a younger generation, um, yeah, it, 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 it's just, it's, it's a little different now. I, yeah, it's weird. Like, the, 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 I feel like the, the pattern, the cultural pattern has been give, like, be more loose right it, like we right. need people so like don't be so rigid right and like that can only go so far right until we're like okay now it's our responsibility as the adults to teach you to how like to be fucking good people yes i'm cursing publicly no no no, no. Yeah, but but <laughs> I, i'm glad that you can understand what i'm saying because yeah. i i, I want to be delicate um I, I don't want to offend uh, especially i have a staff of over 100 people i don't want them to listen and, and be offended but sometimes yeah being it's being a little bit loose and having a, a yeah. short or having a longer leash can can sometimes be a detriment to your building right because right. people feel like they can call out and there's not gonna be any repercussions they can call it last minute they can send you a text message saying i'm not coming in or they can just not oh, show up it's just day. like yeah. yeah and it's like come on this is also a job you have a responsibility to be here yeah. and it affects all of us if you're not right. and sometimes that's a hard thing to kind of finger wag at but it's important right right uh we can move on <laughs> okay <laughs> share one code of conduct or behavior you teach your team a core value a way to be to have fun. What is one uncommon standard of service you teach your team? Something that's common within the four walls of your businesses to go above and beyond guest expectation, but not common throughout the industry. So Keith used this, but really is a great one. Um, our buyback policy. I love it. And yeah. What is that? Just provide people with a good time, buy them some drinks, get them to come back. Um, I think that that's really, really underutilized yeah. tactic. Uh, what you lose in that transaction, will you'll make up tenfold over the totally. time. Totally. And that's how you look at it. Is there a way to track that? Yeah, we bring every single drop of liquor we pour in. Got it. And that's instead a, that's of, a big thing. and we comp it out so is, so we can see it. What are you? And using then you monitor track? that. What do you have? Is it just the toast? I saw you. Um, we have stuff. Aloha. Aloha. Yeah, NCR. And is it um, built in, or is there like inventory management you use? Yeah, no, no, it's built in. And then we do inventory every month, so we can keep track of spills, comps, food comps, et cetera, et cetera. What is one book that's a must read to make us a better person or restaurant owner? I hope you've read this before, um, but the subtle art of not giving a fuck. I have. Oh, it's so good. Yes, I love what it. What was the biggest takeaway from that book for you? To not take everything so seriously. Yeah, and I think that in a world where there's so much you have to be good at, and there's almost like refuge, refuge. Is that the word I'm looking for? Not refugee. Refuge. Refuge. <laughs> yeah. There's there's almost refuge in people who are just like I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Take me for who, who I am, and then if you shed all that weight of that that stress of all the things you got to give a fuck about, you don't. You literally don't have enough fucks to give. Yes. Yes. You can only give so many fucks. Yes. Be selective with your fucks. Yes. <laughs> I also love um, that he talks about because he was like really living like flying by the seat of his pants and he was somebody that just like lived so day to day and he started to realize like I mean he was traveling all over the world and that sounds so cool but he started to feel unfulfilled and he wanted to be grounded and have a family and have a job and sometimes I feel like this day and age people are like I'm just gonna You're do and close the home right now <laughs> <laughs> no but it, I, I thought that that was a really interesting perspective because this is somebody that's been travel he was traveling for five years and he was right. like you know what at the end of the day he just wanted to come home yeah and i thought that was a, a that. good interesting message there's good balance to be found uh, yeah what are you what is what the fuck where do we what's the last question i asked oh wait jared help me out brother thank you what is one thing you feel restaurant tours don't do well enough or often enough uh treating their staff with care 
what is one piece of technology you've recently developed or adopted rather uh, that has had a huge impact on communication, efficiency, profitability, anything along those lines? I know Keith said this too, but BeatGig and Line Leap have changed the game for us. Um, yeah, specifically BeatGig. Um, and it's so funny, but we used to actually go on Instagram and look at other places like other live music venues and see what kind of bands and DJs and acts they were booking and then reach out to them directly, which is extremely time consuming. But Charleston's a small town and there weren't that many entertainers, especially five years ago. And if you could see the same band seven nights a week at seven different spots, you were like, yeah, do you know where they're located? Beat Gig um, is now headquartered out of Tampa, okay. but they're all over. So they, so, I mean, it's a technology platform. Oh. So they kind of route bands all over the East Coast. Let me get them on the show. It, yeah, that. no, you really, really should. Um, it's a really interesting concept, and it, t- it, it has totally changed the game for us. We have been booking bands from all over the East Coast that we would have never heard of um, if we didn't use them. Right. Um, and what about Lineskip? Do you know where they're based? Uh, Line Leap is... Line Leap, I, believe they're based out of jersey uh, we know them through penn state okay um i'm trying to be better about going after not just the people in the industry but the, the satellite yeah the technologies that's associated yeah, yeah. doing more of this inquisitive type conversation uh, thank you for those leads and we are almost done one more question if you got the news you'd be leaving this world tomorrow all the memories of you, your work, and your restaurants will be lost with your departure. With the exception of three pieces of wisdom you can leave behind for the good of humanity and for your legacy, what would those three pieces of wisdom be? I think number one would be bring good energy to any room you walk into. One. Um, have patience. Two. And in order to be a great leader, you have to listen. Three. Kara, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I hope I didn't bring negative energy into today's no, conversation. No, 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 no. Uh, but I, it w- there was such great advice and actionable, specific advice in today's conversation. You left a, a lot for the listeners to, to pull from and to implement in their own businesses. And you're just a lot of fun to be around. I hope so. Thank so, you. So thank you thank very you. much. How can we connect? If maybe we have questions or we want to follow Uptown Social for inspiration, personal handles, business handles. Maybe we want to come work for Uptown Social. Maybe we don't call out ever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're hired. Yeah. <laughs> um, you could reach out to me personally. My email address is Kara, K-A-R-A, at UptownHospitality.com. Um, follow us on Instagram, specifically at Uptown Social CHS, or Sharehouse and Bodega at Sharehouse CHS and Eat Drink Bodega. Um, or you can just DM me on my personal Instagram. It is brand new, Kara, K-A-R-A, Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y, Hammond, my new last name, H-A-M-M-O-N-D. That's a lot of handles to handle. <laughs> um, if you head over to restaurantunstoppable.com slash 992, we'll have all those handles there as well as a summary of today's discussion and any links to tools or services recommended on the show. And uh, I almost forgot to have you call somebody out who do you respect and admire? Somebody that if you found out was a guest on the show, dropping knowledge, you'd be like, I got to tune into that one. So this is somebody, um, she was a regular at Uptown Social um, a few years ago. And her name is Emily Eld. She started her own small business called The Muffin Drop. Um, she was having some severe autoimmune issues and she started her own little business and everything is plant-based gluten-free and i just find her to be so impressive that was emily eld emily eld e-l-d e-l-d-h H. muffin drop look out the emily. muffin drop i'm yes. coming after you i'd love to get you on the show and you already shared your contact information so this is where i say thank you so much there is no question cara you are unstoppable thank you Thank you. Cheers. Well done. Uh, you must hate me. You got three Woo! minutes. <laughs> no, that's, no, 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 okay. no, we're good. Wow. <laughs> that was, that was fun. so fun. Thank you. I wasn't too All hard. right. So <clears throat> just wrapped up my second interview with Uptown Social right here behind me. Um, first interview was with Keith Benjamin. He was amazing. Second interview was with Kara Graves and Kara was just as amazing, if not more. Sorry, Keith. I'm just kidding. You guys are both pretty great. But um, what we discussed in today's episode 
Um, a lot of things we discussed in today's episode. Obviously, we discussed her come up and how she got to where she was. But she, so the cool thing about Uptown Social and the Uptown Hospitality Group is that they are very liberal with equity in their businesses. So, what do I mean by that? They are quick to let their employees buy in to ownership. So, um, I feel like for I don't know why, but in our industry, we're we're very slow to give equity to people um, probably because we're afraid if we give it to them they'll have equity and they'll walk away or they won't work as hard who knows but I, I literally can't keep track of the amount of people that I've heard of who have equity in either Uptown Social or another one of the restaurants in the greater group there's a mother group that's in New York I think they have I don't know at least five or six probably more I really am not even sure but uh, one of the common themes is that they, the reason how they scale is by offering equity because they realize they can't do it alone. So we, we dove into that. We actually talked about the structure, um, like how do you buy in? Is it one point? Uh, like what does that look like? Kara was really generous with kind of spelling that out. Uh, the other thing we talked about is their approach to uh, social media strategy. Like what are the layers? Like what are the filters they're putting into the content they're creating? And like, what are they asking themselves before they post things? So she talks to her strategy. They also talk about how, um, really at the end of the day, one of, the, one of their their secrets is hiring their target market. So who who is their target market? Let's hire people who are our target market. They know what people their age and their demographic are looking for, what they want. They know what's trending and they know what's hip. So they really, open up the channels of communication between themselves and their staff. I think that's a huge lesson as well. And then as the, the conversation progressed, as it evolved, um, we got into some of the, the bigger picture issues with social media. So I think it's kind of ironic that all the, the directors of marketing I'm talking to, they recognize that there's a real issue with social media right now. And it's weird because we're almost blind to it. You know, it's like we, we go through all these motions to promote our business, uh, do what we're told to do, and it's almost like we're, we're, we're living to serve the algorithm at the, the, the greater expense of mental wellness, work-life balance, um, and just the, the fact that we're giving all these companies so much power. Uh, like four companies control so much power when it comes to just influence data uh, it's just kind of crazy to think of. So um, I, I don't know. It's almost like I, I want to encourage like a like industry awakening. And, and if we can encourage the industry to kind of push back or seek out alternative sources that maybe have better ethics and values associated with it, maybe we can influence the rest of the world. Maybe that's a pipe dream. <laughs> Who knows? But uh, it's worth dreaming for. I, I think it's worth a dream. Um, all right. Thanks again to Kara Graves to Keith Benjamin, to Uptown Social, to the Uptown Hospitality Group for the amazing hospitality and uh, just being so welcoming for me and this mission to inspire, empower, and transform the industry.